Hi everyone, and thanks for joining the last seminar of the year. So I'd like to welcome uh, Rohit that uh, was uh, willing to present uh, and, and for the last seminar. So if, I, I, I almost, feel, almost feel like we don't need to introduce you, Rohit, but I'll, I'll do it anyway. So uh, Dr. Rohit uh, Chandra, as you know, is a senior lecturer at uh, the School of Medicine Stats at UNSW and also at their CI. And uh, before, before uh, going to UNSW, Rohit uh, was a uh, research fellow at the CTDS here in UCID. And I think this is where we started developing a lot of the work he's been doing on uh, geoscientific models and, and Bayesian deep learning. And, and of course, that's probably a work that he's been doing for quite a while before that as well. Uh, and yeah, and beside, of course, being an expert in, in, in everything Bayesian deep le and learning, and he's also been a really successful uh, paper machine <laughs> uh, really with a lot of publications everywhere and being also an associate editor of uh, the neural computing and uh, ITP transaction on uh, neural networks and uh, learning systems. So this is a uh, really opportunity to learn a lot about uh, vision deep learning and just trying to fix uh, uh, models. And so Roy, thank you again for willing to present to us. So thank you. Many thanks uh, Gilad for your uh, kind comments and giving me the opportunity uh, for presentation today. Uh, so today, my the topic is machine learning for paleogeology and mineral exploration, spatiotemporal odyssey, and uh, the overview for today's talk it would be uh, about coupling deep learning uh, with plate tectonics uh, uh, models for mineral exploration, paleoclimatology and paleogeology, uh, Bayesian machine learning, uh, then uh, convolutional neural networks for lithological mapping, data augmentation with GANs and uncertainty quantification with Bayesian deep learning. Uh, the thing is, uh, the talk is quite, uh, the presentation is very multidisciplinary. So I'll go, as I go along, I will define some of the terms. I know that there are a number of machine learning people interested in uh, these applications and they are the application people the earth scientists the environmental scientists and mineral exp or exploration geologists uh, interested in machine learning but it's uh, hard to kind of uh, uh, present uh, these topics uh, in one hour in a short time but i will do my best uh, so uh, the first uh, uh, project that I will discuss is about coupling uh, uh, deep learning uh, models with plate tectonic models for mineral exploration. And this was an uh, uh, idea of Professor Dietmar Muller, who is a former IRC laureate fellow and uh, the director for the EdBite group. And uh, me and him, we began supervising uh, Julian, who, is, who did his Master of Science with me when uh, I was at a University of Sydney, then I moved to UNSW and then basically he continued this research. So basically this is a joint research between the two universities and we got a paper published in all geology reviews. Uh, basically this research covers, uh, uh, basically asks questions about uh, the, um, the formation of uh, porphyry copper systems and uh, uh, these uh, systems, they uh, derived in subduction zones, and uh, we need to have a better understanding how they are formed in time and uh, look at uh, the formation uh, of these uh, in the last uh, couple of, uh, not couple of million years, we look at more than 80 million years and see how uh, the plates are moving and how these uh, uh, Porphyry, porphyry copper systems are developing. So we basically connect uh, the subduction zones with the slab properties, uh, with the history of porphyry or deposition across the Americas. So we look at the North America and the South America using a spatiotemporal machine learning approach. And uh, we apply a wide range of machine learning methods in in the framework to test which ones are better. And uh, afterwards, we do develop uh, prediction uh, maps. So when we talk about plate tectonic models, what do we actually mean? So the visualization here would give a bit of a viewpoint. And uh, this is basically, you see on the top, that's MAE refers to the millions of years. And over the last, uh, 
100 million years or so. This is uh, how the plates have been moving. Uh, there was a supercontinent Pangean that broke into smaller continents, but still massive. And you see that uh, uh, the, the movement of these continents uh, was uh, at some point of, of time was quite fast. And at some point of times it was slow. But uh, in the movement, basically, there's a different uh, uh, minerals uh, are were forming. And with the uh, porphyry uh, system here, you can see that you have uh, volcanic activities happening. And there's the continental crust. You have plates moving. And then over these millions of years, basically, uh, the system is uh, developing. So the area of study that we looked at was uh, the North America around these uh, belts and the South America here. And uh, there are all these different uh, timelines uh, in different, uh, different millions of years. You have Jurassic, Jurassic, and Paleogene, Neogene, and Philosene, for example, and uh, basically different uh, at different time zones, there's uh, copper deposits were formed. And uh, the plate tectonic, the visualization that you saw earlier, that was basically a product of um, this plate tectonic models. And uh, uh, basically we are lucky that uh, these uh, models have been developed here in Australia right at the University of Sydney, actually, um, uh, by the Edbyte group led by Professor Dietmar Müller. And uh, basically, the name of the model is G-plates, and it's uh, widely used all around the world. And uh, there is also another a version of this uh, software called uh, the Pi G-plates. So what you see here is basically the G-plate software. Basically, it's an open source software, and you can use it for a wide range of visualization and there's a wikipedia page about it, it as well and this uh, image is from there and uh, in order to basically the the framework that we developed that was using uh, pi g plates which is uh, a repa which accesses the essential tools from the g plate software so this is basically the framework how we are coupling plate tectonics with machine learning. Essentially, the overview is that we are looking at uh, different uh, time zones in uh, millions of years, and we go as far as 80 million years or so. And we are looking at uh, the different uh, two different uh, study regions. We create a testing and training and testing data set from those regions. And uh, we look at uh, different features, basically, we have the data set, uh, as, we, as I outlined in the earlier slide, that, for example, shows that, hey, in the Jurassic area, in these uh, zones, uh, there were the, the copper deposits in Triassic era, it was the other zones. So that kind of information basically is collected. And then basically with the G plates, because we can get information uh, back in time. So basically, we have time slices for every million years uh, uh, over time for the 180 million years or so using uh, something like this. So basically, we know where the deposits are and then what are some of the properties or features around those deposits, right? So we kind of extract all those information, the properties. Uh, and features around those deposits, uh, geological features and properties. And uh, we basically uh, present to the machine learning uh, models these, product, uh, these properties. So uh, there are some of those properties are the subduction, convergence, kinematic statistics generation using uh, G plates and Pi G plates. Basically, Pi G plates is accessing the tools from G plates. And then we get those features for every, uh, for the different millions of years back in time. And uh, kind of those are kind of linked to the de deposit or the formation of porphyry copper. And uh, then uh, we do 
uh, code registration, data cleaning, and uh, check which parameters are highly correlated and so on. And basically then we present it to the machine learning model. And then the machine learning model basically gives us, uh, helps us in prediction. So uh, these are some of the features we get. And this is the data visualization. Basically uh, here you, for example, absolute subducting convergence magnitude we have distance to the nearest trench, deep sea sediments thickness, subducting plate volume, deep sea carbonate sediments, deep sea carbonate sediments over the total sediment thickness ratio. So these are some of the, the features that we are looking at. And uh, then uh, we have uh, uh, the the links to the different types of uh, systems that we have. Uh, so you have porphyry, copper systems, you can see there in red in North America and in um, green, we have those in uh, South America. And there are these other um, unprospective rocks. So basically we are interested in copper, but uh, there are other features that we will uh, produce uh, uh, associated with the rocks that we are not interested in, but still that is part of the data basically. So these are the, those uh, different parameters and we are basically uh, looking at uh, how uh, correlated, how much correlated they are, this is specific correlation matrix basically you can see here. And some of these uh, uh, are highly correlated and they are uh, marked in, uh, hi uh, highlighted in bold. So sea floor age, you see subducting plate of volume uh, is there and all these uh, different parameters uh, as uh, shown in the visualization below. Uh, before. I shot, you didn't even get a signal. Oh, what the hell it was? Excuse me. Um, could you please all uh, just uh, mute your microphones, please? Uh, I muted the, the source. <laughs> That's fine. You continue. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, as I said earlier, that we were not sure which uh, machine learning model would fit the framework well, right? And um, so we tested the different uh, machine learning models for the different regions. And here we see that the support vector machine with RBF kernels, they produced uh, superior results for North America. And uh, in uh, South America, they were similar to random forest, but still better. But uh, they have a bit higher uncertainty. And uh, Gaussian process models did not do that well. So uh, uh, also a major problem uh, was, uh, so basically we had the copper deposits and the associated features. In machine learning, basically you need uh, not just positive training examples. So you can think of them as positive training examples. You also need negative training examples. And we basically uh, generated the negative, synthetic uh, negative, uh, uh, training examples. So uh, here we have go a bit uh, more into details about the different uh, types of predictions. So we have false positive, uh, true positive, recall precision, and all these other um, statistics. So using those results, basically we can now go back in time and uh, look at different areas in these regions and basically uh, make a prospectivity map uh, using these uh, predictions. So we can see that uh, here you can see uh, this color is showing very high prospectivity around these regions here and uh, the green ones are low on top uh, is uh, in uh, around California. Uh, you have uh, then low prospectivity around uh, 
just pointing at here. So that is, uh, you see 80 to 60 million years, but that basically information is changing for 60 to 40 million years. So as the plates have been moving with the subduction zone, all the geological properties are changing. And with them, the, it has affected the formation of the porphyry copper systems, essentially. And here you can see a more recent 23 to 3 million years, which would be more useful for present day. And then you have, uh, and this is for um, South America, and uh, you see very high prospectivity around uh, here. And uh, whereas in the bottom tip, we have uh, uh, less uh, chances, basically. Moving on, then we, again, we see uh, for the South America, the different uh, um, time zones uh, and how this, uh, the prospectivity map has changed over time. So what do we do use that for then? We basically use that, those maps, we can create uh, animation, we can create a series of maps that basically shows the different age uh, of copper deposits overlaying um, you can see these deposits basically here forming how these deposits have been forming and this visualization is uh, made in eight byte group thanks to Dijma. so um, We proposed a deep time spatiotemporal machine learning model and looked at North and South America. And uh, basically the workflow framework is using G5G plates and machine learning and it's all open source. And basically we are providing the software, we're providing the maps generated with the software and this could be used for uh, further research. And we concluded that most of the important of those parameters linked to the formation of porphyry copper systems across North and South uh, America is the absolute magnitude of convergence velocity. So how fast the plates have been moving. This magnitude is on average faster at the time when these systems formed, as opposed to the rates related to the emplacement of non-prospective intrusions. So this is uh, important because this is just not that sort of machine learning where you have uh, data, you have model, and there's the model just makes predictions. We kind of basically are trying to understand how the features come into play, how it kind of helps us to answer the deep scientific questions that could be useful for uh, geologists and paleogeologists, especially. So paleo is basically moving back in time and that's what paleogeology is. We are looking at um, basically a movie of the world in the last couple of hundred million years. The plates have been moving, different systems have been forming. And on the same theme with the Dietma also had uh, this idea to uh, look into paleoclimatology, with paleogeology. So basically um, with Sally, uh, who is, has now moved to data 61 and was a de their director previously, uh, me and Sally did most of the modeling work. And uh, Nathan, Dr. Nathaniel Butterworth, basically is the senior informatics engineer at Sydney Info Informatics uh, group he basically helped us with visualization here i'm taking something from national center for environmental information the NOAA center that shows basically how so what i've been discussing before this was going back in millions of years back in time up to all 100 million years back in time and you see the plates have been moving but when you will look at hundreds of thousands of years back in time, you don't have that uh, mo much movement in the plates, right? But then you have 
a lot of changes in the weather system, you know, the climate, the climate has been changing. Here you can see this from this information. This is not our research. I'm just citing this uh, from NOAA. You can see that the glacial ice was um, somewhere, the, 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 the size of glacial ice coverage was far much higher 18,000 years ago than uh, modern day, for example. So, uh, and here basically what we see it is the different uh, time zones and uh, in these different time zones, sorry, uh, we see uh, the plates in different uh, points of time. We have 250 million years, 150 and 70 million years ago. And you can see how the plates are placed. And uh, basically as the plates were moving, complete weather systems, there were change of complete weather systems, uh, climate systems. And uh, basically we know not too much. All we know about this is through fossil records. And there's a lot of missing information. And sometimes it's mostly artists perception with very little information. Sorry, I just give me a sec. So a bit of background. So that was a bit of background and the uh, uh, background is uh, the term, what is paleoclimatology, study of climates for which direct measurements are not usually taken and then you use proxy methods from earth and life scientists, uh, sciences such as uh, the data preserved within rocks, sediments, boreholes and ice sheets. Basically, a lot of data is uh, a lot of information is unveiled as we drill, right? And but yes, we know that drilling has an environmental impact, right? But uh, uh, with whatever information that is there, we can have a better view of the history of the planet. Paleogeology uses the principles and methods of geology to construct history of Earth and examines the vastness of geologic time measured in billions of years. It covers changes in the Earth's gradual and sudden over deep time. So one is geology, another is climatology, and paleo basically means going back in time, right? And geology and climatology, they are all connected and uh, different phases of Earth, there have been different and with, with also them, basically, we have the evolution of life, right? So different species uh, came about, became even extinct as well. So here, what we see is from the geological survey, uh, US geological survey, a poster about the different uh, age groups, you know, the, the time period. So you have period, uh, Mississippian period, and others. and uh, how they end till to the modern day, right? So, and you go all as far as 2 billion years and it goes all the way to the beginning of the planet, right? So, but um, our interest is actually uh, not that far, but uh, at least uh, the last 250 million years in this project. So there are the current global circulation models uh, it's shown by the National Geographic uh, visualization here. Basically, they capture the climate patterns, the different belts, the different weather patterns, and with them, basically, we, it helps meteorologists kind of uh, make uh, predictions about how things will be in the coming weeks, coming months. And basically, these models are used uh, mostly for um, present uh, age, not for paleoclimatology. And this is one such uh, visualization of uh, how the climate, uh, how um, surface climate is changing over the different uh, uh, time spans, basically. And we have the four seasons and with the four seasons, you could see there would be changes in uh, how much precipitation is there in different parts of the world. So uh, 
these models that are known as the global circulation models, they are quite useful uh, for, um, for understanding the climate, but they have been not used much for understanding paleoclimatology. There's some limited work that the ideas from these models have been used to, for paleoclimatology. But if we want to go all the way back for 250 million years, even time uh, slices per million year, then that would become very difficult because these models could take sometimes months to run. So they need supercomputers. And the other thing is we do not have enough information. And there's a lot of uh, changes in, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, the climate because over this time period, because we have Pangaea breaking up, you have the supercontinent to continents, what we know now, and uh, there have been drastic changes. And uh, and so we need to, in order to understand more about the climatology, paleoclimatology, we need to take into account all these things. But uh, we have seen uh, that there are also the plate tectonic models that gives us some indication about how things were. But those models kind of just show more about how the continents have been moving. But it, these models do not show much information about climatology, you know? So uh, how do we find such information? So what is available is there's data out there that kind of tells us a lot about coal deposits. Why? Because mining companies have been uh, mining all around the world and they have shared some data so sets. And basically coal deposits indicate um, where the forests were, right? So we have data that shows coal deposits, evaporates and glacial deposits. And we basically want to use these data source sets basically to link with precipitation. We want to know that where, uh, how much rainfall was the world expecting at different points of time in different places, right? So we are looking at uh, 13 data-driven uh, maps and uh, we're looking at 14 to 249 million years and want to cover the major changes. So what we have here is, uh, related uh, model estimation, GCM, global circulated, circulation model related estimation of precipitation. And these uh, models took months to run and uh, from these papers. So we have something for the mid Miocene period and we have for the light Eocene uh, period, the precipitation, global precipitation. And we have um, very um, high resolution we basically have these thumbnails, uh, and, but it gives us some indication. And uh, as you can see here, this uh, uh, here is uh, that there are drastic changes if you look at the precipitation. Uh, here, you see that in this, uh, the north of uh, South America, the, there was not much precipitation, but here uh, with the mid Miocene, which is uh, uh, much earlier, uh, there are, there's more precipitation around there. So there are some drastic changes that you can see there. So uh, this is the data set and basically the Miocene, you can see the data, the Miocene period that we are looking at is at a times, the time slice of the Miocene is 14 million years ago. And then we are looking at Eocene, which is 38 million years, right? So we only have data, the precipitation data for them. So these are, that just indicates that these are the data values that we have, the number of grid cells, basically. And the rest of them basically not available. But we do have data points for some areas around the globe for all these different time zones, right? Uh, 
which shows coal evaporate and glacial deposits. And uh, basically what we want to do is to connect these data sets with them. So basically use this coal evaporate and glacial deposits and connect them with the precipitation using a Bayesian machine learning model. And once that is done, then we use that information to test the Eocene time, time period. And then afterwards, basically we extend this information, that model, we expand it, extend it further back in time. Basically then we can have some indication of how the precipitation values were. But the problem here, as you can see, that the precipitation grid, you have 1736 data points, whereas coal, we only know information in a very small uh, set. And uh, for this, basically, we know, we know some things even now. Basically, we know that we have this climate belts. We know that the elevation how high it is kind of has very strong correlation with uh, uh, the amount of rainfall basically you get. So we that's why paleo elevation data is also something we sourced. And this is from some other models that we are using. Uh, and we have, and these are also kind of estimated or simulated, but this is based on some evidence about the past. So we have uh, this paleo elevation map, basically how the world looked like, uh, you know. So uh, some things to consider here is uh, uh, that uh, this is 14 million years ago. You see that there's uh, this height in meters, you know. So uh, 4,000, because why? Because this is, this is when basically the India basically hit uh, somewhat uh, Mongolia and China, right? And before that, there was a time when we have India is kind of an island and 61 million years ago, India is more of an island and basically it's traveling all the way and a time comes around 14 million years, it kind of slowly hits. And that's basically that kind of generates the, the Himalayan range that we have now. But all that was not uh, present uh, before it because they were not together generally. But you, then you see that the elevation of India seems to be quite low. And then you have uh, uh, South and North America there. And uh, those regions had high elevation throughout. So we look at that data and basically we look at uh, the elevation and precipitation for the training data point. And the other thing that we were interested in, another feature was the distance to shoreline from where the coal or the glacial or, or evaporate deposit was found. And basically, and we also look at uh, an, an angle basically uh, that uh, gives uh, some more information about these uh, features. Uh, the, 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 what we see here, this is a good uh, visualization because we see on, in the orange here for the different time zones, basically I showed you that a map, uh, the table beforehand, which basically is uh, showing uh, that at different points of time, how many coal deposits were found, right? And here basically it's giving spatial information that where those deposits were found. So it's basically giving all the, so in orange, you have over time, all the different uh, areas uh, where coal was found. But our Bayesian machine learning model, basically we are using um, MCMC based approach to first impute the data. So we have all this missing information. So all these things other than uh, the orange, basically they are the, what's been imputed because there's a probability that we try to find, okay, those are the places, uh, that, that's what the model gives, that those are the places where there is high probability of coal, some places there's low probability of coal. And this is taking into account the distance to shoreline, the, um, 
um, distance to show line the elevation and so the elevation so what now we have for the first time in um, in this area of research is we have a fine grained uh, you know uh, data uh, produced a data set that kind of has estimated that where the coal deposits were there have been for the last 249 million years and these are some of the maps from there basically and we are producing that data set the thing is this is important uh, because this kind of gives us some indications which areas had forests back in time so this is all uh, about uh, the coal deposits and uh, going back in time then we have glacial deposits and uh, at some points of time there were no glacial deposits because uh, uh, the planet was going through that phase where the average temperature was very high and we also reconstruct the those other evaporates and then based on that basically we kind of have some predi prediction about precipitation this is basically what we are trying to what we have looking at the training and the test data set we have predictions and uncertainty for the precipitation and here basically we have uh, uh, we are looking at a regression coefficients to kind of see which uh, you know um, the correlation of the input features such as distance to shore glacial coal and evaporites with the, the precipitation basically right so basically from this research what we finally did is we did develop a global rainfall for the last 250 million years it, it is a kind of a rough cartoon here but you can see that going back in time the countries uh, or the continents are coming back together so uh, this is not the end this is the beginning of uh, this sort of research and hopefully uh, uh this will motivate more work so uh basically the presence of coal implies that the presence of particular types of forests back in time and this could be uh something that could motivate environmental scientists as well to high, uh, to kind of link with paleoclimatology and other related areas and also uh the biologist interest in uh, uh the history of the planet and how life is forming over the millions of years the evolution of life and so on so i'll just uh, move a bit uh, further on because i have uh, other things to cover uh, so in the same theme there was some work that i did at the university of sydney about using bayesian inference which is a uh, you know um, way to find information or estimate information when, when there's not much uh, of unknown variables right so you have some when prior you have data you have likelihood and you use a base theorem to have estimation or the posterior distribution and that is used using mcmc methods the thing is here is there are similar models called landscape evolution models. And then basically they look at mostly the elevation in the sediment deposits and transportation back in time for millions of years. And you can see the age uh, 100 million years to present day. And so at some point of time, Australia, large parts of Australia was also underwater. And this is also, think of it as also moving at the same time. At some point of time, it was close to India, but then they separated and at the same time it's moving. So, so but uh, for those that time span for the last that 150 million years or so, we do not know what are the exact or good indication of precipitation values over Australia, for example. And that's where Bayesian inference we were using to estimate it. But so this is a product of uh, Dr. Tristan Sells from University of Sydney. And again, Dietma was part of this project. We developed this multi-processing library and software tools, but we just looked at very small uh, areas, whereas uh, the, because these models, they can take weeks to run when you look at a very large area like Australia. So we were looking at very small models and uh, 
We had the research engineer, uh, Daniel was also a part of the project and Ratnil Deo, who is beginning his PhD next year with me, was also part of the project. And basically we see how precipitation versus erodibility, the rock erodibility coefficient, basically that is plays a vital role in shape of mountains and how, uh, you know, um, with high precipitation, uh, these mountains, uh, uh, high areas, basically sediments are formed in the low areas and that whole thing is called from source to sink. So there's all these visualizations and the thing is, that can be created in uh, in understanding the past but the problem is that these models uh, landscape evolution models are computationally heavy and the more you zoom in the more difficult it becomes in terms of processing so how do you go about uh, you know addressing those challenges when such models it, it takes a few days to a few weeks to run some large scale models or Small scale models can take a few hours, but then with Bayesian inference and MCMC, you need to, you know, have thousands of samples, you know, so then again, it can take a long time. So sometimes you can look at smaller regions and try to expand it to the larger regions by the information. Other times you could, that is something that can be done. And you could also use Bayesian optimizations and Bayesian optimization and basically we also developed a whole framework for Bayesian optimization with parallel computing and technologies for understanding the past history of the planet. And in the same theme, but going into a different time zone, uh, there was this whole research about geological reef development. And basically, uh, it's all about uh, as we are going back in time, you know, we have, I mean, let's not look at millions of years back in time, but let's look at the last 50,000 or 100,000 years and the development of the Great Barrier Reef. What sort of information is there? We know that there's estimates of what the, was the water level back in time. And there are the drill cores. There are researchers at the University of Sydney and their collaborators who go to the Great Barrier Reef, there are some stations there, there and uh, one tree reef station, for example, and they have been drilling these uh, reef core, uh, reef areas, and they've been drilling the reef cores, such as this is an example of a reef core that is spanning for 13 meters. And that 13 meters could uh, represent, in this case is representing around 8,000 years, so the more you drill, the more time it represents. And what you find at different layers of that drill core would be the different assemblages. So basically, again, uh, the history of the planet, a lot is in, can be revealed from these uh, drilling activities, which of course harms the environment. But uh, uh, in this type, this is more for research purpose to understand the, how these real uh, reefs have been uh, developing. So Jody Pal did a honors with us, with me and Tristan and jo Professor Jody Webster, who is the scientist who has been there for more than 30 years doing this type of work in reef core development and drilling, and also a partner collaborator in DARE, uh, or sorry, a, a CI in DARE. So we developed a similar MCMC framework to kind of understand what type of environmental conditions these drill uh, different assemblages were experiencing over time. So that basically just an overview of what I've been doing and kind of links with understanding the past and bringing machine learning and Bayesian inference together. The current uh, work that I've been just engaged here with uh, Stuart uh, Professor, Associate Professor Stuart Clark, Dr. Mark Lindsay, uh, and uh, my PhD, our PhD student, Subhash, is looking again at drilling, drill core analysis, but for mining actually. And mining is very important. We have, uh, and uh, hence uh, the, the search for porphyry copper deposits, for example, uh, is a very important activity because in the future, the future we are going to replace a lot of uh, oil and um, uh, uh, exploration activities with the renewable energy, but we need to kind of store energy in uh, energy somewhere, right? We need uh, the equipment for our computers, for the chips. We have we need copper and gold, for example. 
So we need to basically, hence mining activities are important for uh, the near future. We cannot just get a read of mining, etc. Also, uh, basically the drill core analysis research, we are looking at, uh, you know, about 2000 uh, meters from this uh, region uh, in um, um, Western Australia. And uh, we uh, are using unsupervised learning such as principal component analysis, k-means clustering and hierarchical clustering to have some kind of summary statistics of different drill cores so that we know how they are related to each other and what uh, we are expecting if we are going to go further into that area and drill. Should we, we in this way, basically, with the unsupervised machine learning, we could uh, probably eliminate or reduce the number of drilling sites and have a better understanding of the geology of the area, basically. So that's uh, all uh, more about drilling and looking at the past of the planet for the last hundreds of millions of years to tens of thousands of years in terms of the reef development. But then uh, the research that I've kind of moved on now and more active in is looking at deep learning and remote sensing and convolutional neural networks are prominent in deep learning methods and for lithological ma mapping and other mineral ex exploration activities. So again, we have a deep mind the project and then this is a joint uh, university collaboration with uh, uh, Malaysia uh, University, Malaysia Terengganu and uh, UTS Sydney and Iran and University of Sydney. So, and uh, we have Ehsan here who has been part of the these projects because he did a PhD with me uh, as an external supervisor and he's still working with me on some projects and he just joined the uh, University of Sydney with uh, Professor Dietmar Müller. So uh, lithological mapping is very critical to geological mapping and could be used in understanding and potential uh, mineralization uh, and as implications for prospectivity mapping. So it's challenging to, you know, have these maps in um, areas where there are not much resources. They are, are, you cannot go to some very remote areas and uh, just look for samples, right? So you need to use advanced technologies and one advanced technology is remote sensing. Of course, this can be further leveraged with, uh, with the drone uh, based imagery as well, but we are not looking at it at the moment. We are looking at different types of uh, satellite data, ESTA, and the Sentinel-2. Uh, and basically this is a global lithology map, basically gives an indication of you know, these different types of uh, you know, lithology types uh, published in the Global Biogemical Cycles, the journal. And uh, what we want to kind of have is, this is kind of uh, more of uh, high resolution. We want to go into more lower resolution where we kind of focus in small areas and see what are the deep, uh, you know, lithology. So in those areas. So basically we are looking at uh, this uh, region in, um, in um, Iran basically. And uh, in that region, we are looking at the different uh, types of uh, lithology uh, mapped by D and C, for example, we see the D basically taking the photos there and the C's are some basically geologists also went into that area to check. And basically some spatial distribution of uh, the rocks uh, uh, as a ground truth. So we have some, uh, because after we developed a map, a lithological map, we want to kind of check it with existing data to see if our map is good enough. So this is what ground truth data we have. Convolutional neural networks have been useful in deep learning and they are applied to many applications such as recognition of cars, faces, or for autonomous driving, and uh, for um, things uh, in areas even in medical image, 
imagery. And this is basically looking at a, a area of neuroscience where CNN has been used to identify tumors, brain tumors, and also identify some uh, lung infections actually. So that is what CNN has been mostly used for, but uh, what we are dealing with, the data that we are dealing with is multispectral and hyperspectral data. This is satellite data and their formats are very different. Whereas these data sets, the format is just, you have three layers, uh, RGB layers. Whereas here, a hyperspectral data, you can have more than a hundred different layers, you know, in the data set, which kind of express different aspects of the data. And you have, you can see basically there are different types of satellites. And uh, these data sets are not like, you know, small uh, data sets where you take it with a phone and you can store easily. This is, these data sets are, if you go into um, fine ingrained uh, information, uh, you know, it can take gigabytes uh, of uh, data storage to look into an area which is only 20 to 30 kilometers, right? So the, we have to be careful how we use a convolutional neural network. So essentially we need to basically divide the, the data set into smaller pieces, into grids and basically use convolutional neural networks to go over those grids. Basically, this is kind of a framework uh, that is used. And uh, basically, we want to have uh, uh, those data sets are processed by small grids and the convolutional neural network is basically, the grids are, we slide the uh, convolutional neural networks over the data source. And basically, uh, in that way, basically, we develop uh, different prospectivity maps, but we did compare convolutional neural networks with other machine learning methods, such as support vector machine and multi layer perceptron, and we found that convolutional neural networks were quite better, much better, and uh, we are supplying the over the data. We are supplying the maps, the open source data uh, software in a Jupyter notebook to be useful for the machine learning uh, community. And basically we have been uh, quite active in uh, remote sensing and uh, deep learning or machine learning for mineral exploration. So recently, um, basically we developed this, uh, uh, we had a project where we did a detailed literature review about different types of remote sensing data sets. What are some of the major target features, machine learning methods, major machine learning methods that are used for different types of maps that can be produced and published in remote sensing of environment in January. And basically this uh, review has highlighted the need for deep learning methods in uh, different areas and also latest clustering methods as well. So the road ahead, uh, I found this image quite interesting, so I just thought to use it, but <laughs> yeah, there's no, uh, nothing uh, I can say about it, but uh, it's an important, it's an interesting visualization of the road ahead. Um, uh, so uh, basically we can use convolutional neural network, the road ahead for other mineral exploration challenges, such as alteration, zones and basically that's what we are uh, doing with the hydrogen from iit jammu and Esan and my colleague and friend anurag sharma from the university of the south pacific in fiji and basically this is uh, some uh, uh, kind of uh, an overview of some of the different alteration units and basically just as we were doing lithological mapping we want to use that same infrastructure just uh, similar data sets uh, it could be multi hats spectral and hyperspectral looking at alteration zones. Moving on, uh, uncertainty quantification with Bayesian uh, deep learning is very important for uh, mineral exploration, climate project related projects. And recently I've been developing, we've developed the Bayesian autoencoders via MCMC deep. This is a deep autoencoder and it can be used to compress data or get meaningful information from data and uh, uh, basically, with colleagues, uh, with Pavel, who is a colleague here at the UNSW, and uh, two Indian students, uh, uh, 
uh, Mahir in uh, Mana. We have been developing this and uh, now we are extending it with uh, Professor Scott Season, who is the director of the UNSW Data Science Hub. And I have two Indian students from uh, IIT Jammu and uh, Pulkit and Sharvan from Manipal Institute of Technology. And they are working very hard uh, trying to develop a whole open source software framework for recurrent neural networks and convolutional neural networks via MCMC methods. And uh, that can be extended to uh, mineral exploration and other data activities. Another problem with, uh, with uh, mineral exploration or climate science uh, or paleogeology, paleoclimatology is the lack of data, uh, sometimes lack of missing data. And uh, uh, one potential is idea is to explore generative adversarial networks for data augmentation. And GANs are basically these neural networks with a discriminator and ge uh, generator that basically where the generator maximizes the probability of making the discriminator mistake uh, inputs as real and the goal of the discriminator is guiding the generator to produce more realistic images in the process basically we can generate data and that generated data can be useful in further improving the machine learning models and this is uh, basically trying to show exactly that how uh from uh, how fake data is generated and uh, which looks more and more close to actual images and, and basically this basically does not need to be restricted to images only it can be applied to other pattern classification problems the non-images data sets and we have shown that in this paper with uh, anurag sharma from university of the south pacific and Prabhat from Indian Institute of Technology, uh, that it could be very helpful in improving uh, the GAN uh, framework or the smartified GAN framework in terms of the F1 score. You could see for wine classification, which is E. coli and yeast. These are some very well known machine learning data sets. Then, the related projects that we are getting into in 2022 is more coupling deep learning with models with hydrological models. We have Arpit Kapoor, who me and uh, Professor Lucy Marshall will supervise at UNSW, and he's part of there. And then, uh, geological reef evolution data. So, the drill course that we're looking at, which we were kind of coupling with uh, the reef evolution model developed by Tristan. We are going to go further with that is just looking at the data and we are going to have CT scans of the reef for data. And we are going to use convolutional neural networks and related deep neural networks to do image segmentation and classification. And that is with Tristan Sales and Professor Jody West and Rathani is joining in as a PhD student in there. The other collaborators I have uh, uh, their director Willem and then um, uh, CI Martin from UNSW and then Professor Robert Korn is uh, also research active with me uh, and Pavel is my colleague here. So I will be looking for applications of Bayesian deep learning for data problems and uh, Willem and Martin, they are going to co-supervise uh, two honors students with me next year and uh, Dr. Richard Scalzo, who is also a DEA chief investigator, will uh, co-supervise our honor student. So these are some of the references, basically, I'm coming to an end, finally. Uh, uh, the, all the papers that I've discussed, there's open source software available in the GitHub repository. Uh, many thanks for, to everyone for attending, and special thanks to all those people who I haven't mentioned in the talk and um, but they have been there behind the scenes uh, with likes shares comments when you put papers on github sorry not papers on linkedin and twitter and facebook and other sites and uh, those things have been very motivating thank you so much everybody thank you very much very extensive work <laughs> uh, impressive um, any questions I might start with one question that I ah go okay. the problem, okay. but maybe I'll I'll start first. If it is too hard, I won't buy the beer for you on Friday. Okay. 
by the alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's it's about the paleo climatology, yeah. Yeah. maybe all all the one that you propagate. Some there is some sort of model uh, running in the in the in the background. So I, I'm not sure I understand. How do you propagate uncertainty from these models? Or are, do you there is a method of propagating the uncertainty? You said, for example, you got elevation or some other estimate that you get from various models. Do we need to propagate the uncertainty or or do we have the uncertainty that we can propagate? Um, and how yeah, so uh, we... with these maps actually, which I'm not showing, but these maps are in the paper. We have like the maps uh, that shows the uncertainty for these maps basically. So we have exactly similar maps next to these maps and those maps basically show the uncertainty and basically how's the uncertainty um, uh, calculated because we have a Bayesian model uh, where we are using MCMC and uh, we are using a posterior distribution after sampling. So basically we uh, take the fifth and 95th uh, credible interval and uh, what is happening there in uh, other terms is the areas that uh, have more information uh we have low uncertainty around those uh, areas such as where we have um, what do we find so the areas where we have the presence of coal already and we have uh, other geological feature information we found that we have low uncertainty in those places and naturally those places where you have very large regions for example here with missing information we will have a higher uncertainty in both in prediction of coal and uh, precipitation. But, but do you propagate the uncertainty from the other models? So if you, for example, you've got the input of elevation, is a, I'm not sure it was on this one, but, or some other climate, let's say model, do you propagate some sort of an uncertainty from that or is this just uncertainty given your model basically yes yeah, so this is basically i would say more model driven uncertainty that we are propagating not data driven uncertainty so basically we are taking the information from uh, such as the elevation models as it is we are not kind of accommodating the uncertainty in terms of data but we are uh, that is uh, the data uncertainty and its propagation those are limitations and could be extended in future research basically okay thanks robert hello that was a very nice talk rohit that uh, covered a lot of areas thank but you that it's a pleasure it's a pleasure i'm sitting here looking at my garden, uh, but there's a few things to say. Um, now, the first thing is that a lot of your results must depend on the priors that you put on because for some of the applications, you don't have uh, much data over a span of many many years so the priors must be probably because of the scarcity of data the priors must play a big role if you're doing a bayesian analysis especially under in uncertainty quantification so i think it's very important to in these applications to have methods for um uh, determining reasonable priors. The second point is that if you're looking at evolution, you're looking at time series data. And I would imagine that there are a number of latent variables that you have to uh, include in the model for realism, but you don't observe them and therefore the models are gonna be, uh, should be probably uh, involve time series with latent variables. Now, it's not clear that your software can actually 
cope with any of those models that uh, have latent variables in them. Everything has to be uh, essentially computable in order for the parallel computation to go through. So uh, the question would be in all of these models, how do you um, how do you cope with realistic dynamic models? Do you, I, I'm not sure if you have them, but if you have them, how do you put in the latency uh, and how do you estimate things? Thanks, uh, thanks, Robert. First thing about priors. Do, do, I, I, do I still do I still get the beer? Oh, okay, let's see. You know, uh, yes, um, uh, we'll decide on Friday. <laughs> anyway, so th thanks. So these these are very uh, important and va valid questions uh, in terms of uh, the priors. So there are uh, specific parameters or. Uh, variables of interest such as like some things you know that uh, they they would be in a certain range and you could always make assumptions based on them for example precipitation when we look at uh, for example the uh, the landscape evolution model project basically in this project we were basically predicting the precipitation back in time whereas in the landscape evolution, yeah, this one, we were kind of estimating the precipitation back in time. So that, that estimation is an unknown parameter in the landscape evolution model. So basically, if you specify a very high level of precipitation to this model, what will happen is basically it will start eroding Australia all around the place very fast. And a time will come when most of Australia will be underwater and that will not like link with the data. So based on, on such examples, what we would do, we'll make assumptions of uh, rainfall patterns in the last 20, 30 years of data which are available. And we basically use them as priors, although we are using that extending uh, back to uh, 20 uh, 200 or 150 million years so that that is one thing that we have done in this project but uh, now that we have basically information from this project that hey you know different uh, time time zones the priors may change so uh, in that basically so some of this uh, information can be useful in constructing priors for the landscape in evolution project, basically. So because with this uh, data that is obtained from precipitation over the millions of years in the past, we could use that to feed the, these models to kind of show the evolution of the landscape. And uh, that is just one example, but... Uh, but and hold on, it, but precipitation is not a parameter. Uh, in, in this you've model, got, you've, got, you've got parameters in there and you've got plenty of parameters in there, or you should have, and the question is on the parameters. Yes, yeah, so, so on these parameters, if you say, what are the, uh, so this, this is, these, these are the covariates and uh, what are the priors on the parameters for the model, right? So if that is your question, then that is basically, we would assume whatever is uh, the posterior of related models, we could take information from them to think of a prior, right? And that's what we do for Bayesian neural networks, you know? I mean, it's not the, the best, thing to do, but some information of related models is better than no information. Uh, but do you actually carefully study the sensitivity of the results to the priors? A huge chunk of time was taken in these projects in uh, uh, 
other problems that emerge, you know. So sometimes in setting different uh, geoscientific models in uh, processing data and visualization, we did not have that much of time to be very specific about uh, such sensitivity analysis. Uh, the so yes, that would we would say is a. a, a looking at different types of priors but that could be more of a, a related future work that we could get some of our students to do actually actually so, the goal yep sorry continue so one interesting area would be to figure out reasonable priors not just sensitivity but figure out how to get reasonable price because if you're going back so many years then uh the prior must play a huge role in what results that you get uh, about what happened 100 million years ago so it's 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 actually formulating reasonable price as well Yes, I agree, but I think the uncertainty related to model parameters would be, I would see that as a smaller problem compared to the uncertainty related to the data or the availability of the data and the data, because we are dealing with data that is going millions of years back in time from fossil records, you would have a lot of uncertainty in terms of collection of data, in terms of analysis of data. And uh, we do not also have uh, all these companies that are widely sharing the data. You know, we, let's note that we have done this project with very limited available data, but it's not that data is not available there. It's that, that the companies are when you look at a geoscience or mining related projects, the companies are basically competing with each other. And if somebody knows has more data, then they will basically be finding the source of porphyry copper deposit or oil or gold first, and they will start drilling there and they will be winning the game. So that's why data is basically not shared that widely. And that is a big challenge for us and the, collection of data as well, you know, like when was the data collected and what sort of instruments were used in data collection at what time. So those types of uncertainties are even harder than the model uncertainties that we are looking at because model uncertainties, we can always try, uh, you know, mixture of uh, different experts. We can try different types of models that ranges from Statistical, statistical learning models to machine learning and deep learning models. And we could get different sources of forms of uncertainty quantified in terms of model parameters. But the major problem is the data driven uncertainty that I see at the moment. Okay. Anything else, Robert? Yes, there was. Now, in terms of the dynamics, uh, you've got a dynamic model for uh, how things change. Meaning the landscape evolution model or? Oh, or whatever, whatever model you've got, uh, you, you know, you, you're covering a lot of years. So presumably there must be a dynamic model behind yeah, this. Yeah. And that dynamic model is deterministic uh, what sort of model have you got have you got gaussian models or what sort of models do you have these, these models so when we say geoscientific models that are these are non-machine learning models they are deterministic models basically like this is a that you know g plates or plate tectonic models basically. And, and these are and so it's all deterministic is it Yes, these are deterministic and the landscape evolution models are deterministic and these models, the thing is these models are so complex, it's so hard to, and they are very, they take a lot of time to run, right? So it's so hard for us to look at uncertainty quantification of specific model parameters. It's basically at times it is what geologists think 
you just take that expert knowledge as model parameters, basically, for these models. So your models are basically y equals f of x plus error, where the error is Gaussian, is it? Yeah, that's, uh, th those are the, yeah, that's, that's the model perhaps for, you could see for the work done by Sally and me. For, so we're de dealing with a wide range of models in this discussion. One is we have geoscientific models, which are looking at plate tectonics, deterministic models. Then we have geoscientific models for reef evolution. We have geoscientific models for uh, landscape evolution. They are deterministic models and they are built uh, taking into account geology, expert knowledge. And uh, we will also deal with hydrological models as well in there. And we are, have a number of projects doing that already. So the, the machine learning comes into play, whether you are using machine learning models to kind of guide or aid them. And the other thing is then the MCMC approaches come into play when we are estimating model parameters such as rainfall or erodibility that is fed in those models, right? So that's a different, uh, area altogether. What here I am kind of putting everything in one basket. I'm just saying, yeah, for this type of problem, this is the approach you need to take. Thanks. Thanks, Rohit. That was a really nice talk. Thank you, Robert. Yeah, Thank, right. you. Thank you very much. It was really nice. Again, we'll I guess we'll we'll meet next year. So and Ray, thank you for ending the year with a you know high note. Uh, so on a high note. Uh, well, thank you again.